Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, I'm going to start my clock now. Uh, I appreciate you having me on here. Bill is one of the best tactical marketers I've ever seen. He gets into the nitty gritty in a way that I don't think many other people do. I appreciate you having me on, brother. So my name is James Helm. I'm the founder of Top Dog Law. From our name, you can probably tell that we're out there. I'll show you guys real quick. I'm actually at my office. This is my podcast studio called The Dog Pound. Behind it here, I got a graffiti wall. We had a graffiti artist from Philadelphia come do this wall. So you can tell it doesn't look very much like your traditional law firm. We try to be different. I think good marketing is standing out and looking as different from your competition as possible. And that's what we do here for better or for worse. But things weren't always like that. So let me, let me tell you guys a little bit about myself. My goal when I was growing up was always really to just impress my dad. Probably think a lot of people are like that. Particularly, I feel like men with their dads. Um, I just wanted him to be proud of me. And so uh, I went to law school. I did really well in law school. I interned for first the, the district court of New Jersey, the chief judge, and then the third circuit. And then here's the final thing. And I love my fellow plaintiff lawyers here. Um, I wanted to be uh, a corporate lawyer. I thought that that was like the prestigious on-campus interview process that they push us towards in law school. And I was like, I'm going to get one of those coveted spots that have the big salaries out of law school. Um, I knew in my heart it was really because I wanted my dad to be like, you know, my son works at this prestigious law firm. And so, uh, what I did was I went into that like eight week summer associate program. Thank God I landed one and I worked my butt off like two to three days a week, staying till 11 PM doing really whatever I had to do to try to get that offer. And I still remember the day the, uh, the hiring partner at that corporate law firm here in Philadelphia called me and he told me they were going to extend a, a commercial litigation offer to me. I went crazy. I had this awesome dinner with my dad and we celebrated. And then I woke up the next day and what I realized, and I think a lot of you, you know, being plaintiff lawyers have already realized this. I hope you have is that the defense world like isn't what it was cracked up to be. Give me, give me a comment in the chat right now if you agree with that. I know I saw the looks on some of the partners' faces and I was like, these people don't seem happy. These people don't seem like they, you know, really love their work. I thought I wanted this, but I don't think I do. And I ran my dad's race. And now I was committed. I'm like, I'm going to run my race. And my race was you're a cog in the wheel, right? I mean, my race was I'm going to build my own law firm. I'm going to go for it. And I'm going to do personal injury because I want to work with people. And so I was super excited. I went, I called uh, the one person I knew, Bill actually connected me with him because they were doing some marketing for him at the time. He was a big doctor who owned uh, some facilities in the Philadelphia area. So I went to him and I'm, um, feeling all confident and I walk into his office and we get coffee before any clients have come in and I say, Hey doc, I'm going to be opening up my own personal injury law firm here in Philadelphia. And he sat there and he just kind of looked at me and was like, well, what's your budget? You understand there are law firms here in Philadelphia that spend over a million dollars a month on personal injury advertising. It's the most saturated practice area in a highly competitive market. How are you ever going to compete in this market? I remember the feeling of walking out of that room and I was like, oh man, I really might have messed up by declining this law firm offer. I got home and I was like, okay, I, I really have two options. Um, I could tuck my tail between my legs and call the hiring partner. I had worked really, really hard as a summer associate. Uh, maybe he'll just take me back, right? <laughs> like beg for me back. Or I have to get creative. I, I have to figure out a way 
to make this work. I need to figure out with no budget in the, one of the most competitive practice areas in one of the most competitive cities with no reputation and again, no budget, how to generate business to get my own law firm off the ground. And so during this point in my life, I'm like miserable. Um, Bill I was going to say negative budget. <laughs> yeah, negative. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, of that. I'm like probably nearing more depressed than I've ever been. And I'm, I play basketball. I'm an active guy. I've always been an active guy. I'm outside playing basketball where I live. And what I realize is there's these other guys playing basketball and they have these huge social media followings and they're using their social media accounts to bring in business for their various businesses. They're what you would label as influencers, right? People laugh. Like I, I, at first I laughed at like, okay, what is an influencer? Like that's some YouTube prankster. Like I, I don't, I didn't really know, but I was like, these guys are influencers and it, somehow they're, they're recording videos and creating content on their social media page and then they're asking people to be clients or to buy stuff. Pause. Yep. Everyone absorb what he's saying right there because if you guys, you should open up his, his, his handle. Also, is, is that the Ali Awad, the CEO lawyer that just commented in there? Yeah, All that's right, my guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's we'll my we'll guy. pull him in as a panelist when, when you get through. Yeah, um, he's, yeah, and my buddy Brent Sibley is also in the house. He texted me. He's like, I think right. this is you. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll pull him in as a panelist um, once, once you're done. So, um, you know, I really want you uh, to get as tactical as you possibly can here. Um, people understand, you know, people understand, uh, I think, your story, which is pretty cool. When we get a chance, guys, I'm going to show you how James and I, notice how James just stated his story before he went into tactics, how I always state my story before he went into tactics. For all of you, you see CEO lawyer do this in, in, in a lot of his videos as well, right? Whenever you do a speech of any form, for those of you who want to pull off webinars like we did this morning with hundreds of lawyers on it, always start with your story first like james just did i just had to pull that out um all right so keep going james what what are the how the hell did you pull this off and and tell tell everyone what is the end result that you're about to explain that you pulled off sure so so let me tell about my first social media lead so i started um i started just filming right i got out my phone i turned my phone around everybody films their phone out this way not very many people want to film in, right? Like they're, they're terrified to film in because uh, you're awkward. You don't know what to say, um, particularly if nobody's following you, right? You're like, oh my God, I'm getting like three likes on everything that I do. But the first thing I did was I just started making videos, like frequently asked questions. I started filming myself. I created a page. I started putting those videos out into the universe. I started from zero. And I think that's important to say because before I started my law firm Instagram account, I had very little experience with Instagram. I was not somebody who had been on Instagram since like 2013. I, I really had no idea. Um, and so I said, okay, I'm going to start from zero. Um, and I remember the girl who gave me the first social media lead, we had dated at the time. And we, she said, Hey, my sister's in a car accident. And we were kind of on like weird terms. So I was like, you know, I'm not Dude, gonna... I remember that lead. I remember you called me and we were so pumped. <laughs> we were so pumped. But I do the funny thing. I don't even think I confessed this to you because I was so embarrassed. I didn't even recognize it as a lead. She was like, finally, she's like, my sister's back really hurts. Do you know a lawyer that does this sort of thing? And I'm like, I, I do this sort of thing. I'm a lawyer. I do this. Right. And so it was like, Oh my gosh, I do this. And I got that social media lead. And after that, it was like proof of concept. It was like, Oh my God, I can use this to generate business for my law practice. Um, and so I'd like to, to, uh, jump into just a couple tactical things. Um, I, 
use this as my primary lead source today. I've since, since I've grown my law firm, I've been able to use this to bring in, you know, 30, 40, 50 uh, new leads a week, which has translated into uh, a lot of clients per month. And then of course, once you bring in clients through one marketing method, the smart thing you can do is then diversify. So now I work with Bill for my pay-per-click campaign and I've been able to do all sorts of other marketing. These are some of my first videos that he's, that he's showing you guys now. Um, Dude, remember how much you prepared for some of these? And, oh my and God. So I would film, I would take like an hour or like an hour and a half for every video. I would do it like seven or eight times. I was just so insecure. There's something about getting on camera for the first time that's like the most nerve wracking thing in the world. I was just scared. I, I was scared that other people were going to judge me or that I was going to look stupid um, or that like all my other lawyer friends would start a group chat texting about how dumb I was on social media. Um, all those, all those feelings popped into my head and it's just about moving through that. Um, this video is what blew you up a lot, right? Yeah, that was my first, that was my first comedy video. Um, you can play that. from that automobile collision yesterday. I gotta call that lawyer I saw on Instagram. What was his name? Top Dog? Car accident? Let's get you paid. <laughs> oh my God, dude. Bravo. Bravo. That is amazing. All right, keep going. Keep going. Tell, tell people how, how the hell... All right, how do you get 50 leads a week, dude? Yeah, so so I'm just my own goofy self, and that's exactly, I've been like that, Bill knows me, I've been like that since I've been five years old, and what I'm not afraid to do is be that same authentic, genuine person on camera. Um, so let's start, here's, here's the first thing, right? And you guys wanna get out your pen and paper, you wanna write this down, is you gotta stop buying social media ads and create your own network. I don't mean that there's anything wrong with social media ads. I run social media ads today. But how you conceptually think about this, guys, is that what you're building is a network. What most marketing companies do, and this is the pitch that I had heard, is they want you to make uh, a post about a free consultation or about something you do. And they want you to pay you know, however much per month to boost that to the top of the feed, whether that's on Instagram, whether that's on Facebook, whether that's on LinkedIn, right? That's kind of the strategy is we're gonna create one post, we're gonna boost this up to the top of the page, and hopefully a bunch of people in your area will see it, and if you happen to catch anybody in the snap moment that they need your business, for me that's an emergency service, right? If I happen to catch somebody who looks at that ad the day after they're in a car accident, then they'll call me, then they'll reach out to me. And the correct way, or at least just my opinion on this, how I think that, that you should think about your channel, is that it's a network. And if you're constantly using your channel to solicit or to call, for act, call to action, right, to ask for business directly, why would anybody watch your channel? It's nothing but commercials. Would you watch a TV channel that's nothing but commercials where people are just asking for their business, right? You wouldn't. You would want, to, want something that makes you feel something, right? Like something that you follow because you thoroughly enjoy it. And this is the second point I wanna talk about in creating your own network. And that's you need to be the face of your network. I think a lot of lawyers have this idea with their marketing, and Bill, you can chime in here, that they're going to give their marketing responsibilities, particularly their social media responsibilities, to a young boy or girl fresh out of college with a marketing degree, and they're going to say, you handle the social media. The problem, people connect with people. 
as the owner of the law practice, you need to be the face. People don't identify with nameless, faceless brands. And if you're having somebody run your social media account that's not you, I don't know, would you want them to be the face of your social media? Um, I think that's what led, led to my success and led to the success of the people who are doing well, and I mean really well on social media, is that they're the face of their business. We just had Alexander Shinaro, the most famous person in the state of Alabama, uh, on our webinar today. And you guys tell me this, okay? Alexander Shinaro has a, the biggest litigation division, uh, litigation piece of his practice, right? And he doesn't just market to those cases, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the light bulb. James is pulling in a handful of catastrophic PI, catastrophic medical malpractice cases every month but he ain't targeting them with 100% of his marketing. He's targeting mass awareness, movement, right? Level stuff. And this is what Alexander Shinara does with his $18 million a year advertising budget. The guy has 2,500 billboards across the state of Alabama. There's, there's prank videos made about how many billboards he has. He is a household name. Everyone knows him because of that. He channels some of the leads towards his volume practice, some of the leads towards his uh, Marlin practice with the Marlins, the cases that are a million and plus, as he said on today's webinar. He has a litigation practice and a volume practice. So I, I love what you're saying, James, because it's like sometimes people go right for the throat. They just want to market to this niche. But in that, they lose mass awareness, which I know CEO lawyer can talk a lot about. Go ahead. Your it's, next it's social media is a social platform. And so um, if you're not being social, if you're not engaging on other people's stuff, if you're not responding to your followers, if you're not answering direct messages that are separate from the crux of your business that are just, you know, people trying to get helpful information, then you're missing the mark when it comes to social media. Um, and, and the, second, the second kind of point I want to make here is how to make your channel everybody's favorite. Because um, you can tell I do like the comedy, right? That's my thing. I took improv classes. Like I like to be a goofball. Um, I think comedy tends to work really well on social media. But if that's not you, don't force it. That doesn't have to be you. There's other ways to make your channel everybody's favorite. And I... Uh, I'm putting together a workshop. It's actually topdogsocialsecrets.com. In that workshop, I talk about five content types, and I'll, I'll share that with you guys today, is that you can be inspirational. You can talk about personal content. You can talk about entertainment. You can talk about social proof, right? These are all different content types. And the thing with these content types, people want to see your family. People want to see you like, excited, inspired for the day, right? People don't want to see you just answering educational videos. And that's one of the content types. That's the fifth content type is responding to frequently asked questions. But it's just my opinion that your platform can't be purely education. You need to be multifaceted. They want to see the pictures of you with your girlfriend, right? <laughs> this is why you guys need to find people you can collaborate with in your market, right? What's going on, man? Top dog. Top dog. You sure ain't top dog? You get in my car? What was that, Sean? Yeah, just that lawyer I told you about. Lawyer? Don't look like I care? Sorry, I'm just joking, man. Don't look like I care because I don't. You get in my car looking like Clark Kent. Then I'm dressed like an old Navy man with the two buttons at the top. What the hell did you just get in a stranger car? So get, who is this, man? You got to give him a chance. Listen to his slogan. Tell him, bro. Top dog gets you top dollar. You sure a top dog don't strip for dollars? You look like a gigolo. You look like you dance at Woody's. Get out of my car, my man. Right now. Get out. I thought you said that was cool. It's black belt and karate. And I never did no karate, boss. He's about the black belt I used to whoop his ass. The same one I'm going to use to whoop his ass if you don't get out of my car. Now. So where you going? I'm going with him. So the only one going to need a lawyer is me for when I whoop you behind me. Get home. Sit back. Let me see that number, man. I said, give me your number. Thank you. Man, get the hell out! <laughs> oh, man. Guys, it, they're, they're, you are only limited 
by the the level of creativity that you can pull off, man. Go ahead, James. Yeah, um, and and I want to answer a question in the chat here from Christine because it looks like a uh, a really awesome question. She says, "How do you do all of that and still practice law? I'm the only attorney at my firm and knee deep in just practicing. How do you timely respond and engage on social media?" And and that I think right there is the is the biggest objection that uh, most people have to doing this sort of strategy. And it's understandable. I mean, I get it, right? Um, I'd say two things. I'd say first, the very first hire I made at my law firm, and I think this is a little bit controversial, is I hired a marketing director. I hired somebody that could help me make money as opposed to hiring an operations person, like a paralegal to help me do the legal cases, right? And the reason I did that was because he could do all the technical stuff that you see with the titles and the captions and Photoshop, a lot of the stuff that, you know, Bill's team does for him in terms of how he creates these webinars that he just talked about. That was the first hire. And that was super helpful for me was like getting somebody on my team who had this sort of skill set. Um, the second thing is that I think the highest leverage task you can do at your business is generate new business for the firm. Um, I happen to be in a position where I can work with strategic partners, right? If I have a medical malpractice case, or even if I have a car accident case, that's a unique circumstance, I can work with another law firm in my area and co-counsel that and we can split attorney's fees. And I'd rather do that and have somebody help me with the operations part of a case until I get up to speed because I'm still a new lawyer and maintain my time on my marketing because my marketing is my engine that drives my practice. I want to spend just as much time on my marketing per week as I do on my legal cases. And, and that's a little controversial. I know a lot, you guys can let me know what you think in the chat about this specific topic. I know uh, a lot of people don't think that way, but Bill, you can talk about your experience. I would say some of these panelists that you've been having on the webinar, some of the most successful lawyers, they're working on their business, not in their business.